Welcome everyone. It's so good to have you here for this event, Dreaming an, an Ecological Civilization with Matthew Fox and John Cobb, uh, both of whom have done so much to help so many of us dream our way and act our way into a civilization of respect and care for the community of life. This event is sponsored by two organizations, the Center for Spirituality in Ontario, California, and Gianluigi Guglielmetto is director of that, and he'll be saying a word about it shortly, and the Cobb Institute of Community for Process and Practice. And Kathleen, Kathleen Jacobson works with them, and she'll be introducing the Cobb Institute. Then they will introduce Matthew and John Cobb, and we'll be off. And I'll help facilitate it. My name is Jay McDaniel. So welcome again. And John Luigi, please get us started. Thanks, Jay. Uh, we are a small institute in Ontario, which is very close to Claremont. And we think of ourselves a kind of a sister uh, institution with the Cobb Institute. Uh, we are trying to dis rediscover the wisdom tradition in Christianity, the idea of hospitality, of differences, hospitalities of people, of stories and experiences before creeds, before we get to what we believe or don't believe. We have, think of four pillars for what we do, ecology, nonviolence, personal growth, and community. So you can go on our website, which is very simple, centerforspiritualityontario.org, centerforspiritualityontario.org, to see our many programs. And I just want to publicize one of them because it's related to Matthew Fox. I'm going to, to have a series of meetings on one of his major books, his first major book, Original Blessing, which is starting in October. So everybody's welcome to that. Thank you so much. And Kathleen, would you tell us a little bit about the Cobb Institute? Greetings, everyone. The Cobb Institute began about a year and a half ago as the Claremont Center for Process Studies. Um, and it was created by John Cobb and others to carry on the tradition of promoting process thought in the Claremont area when the Center for Process Studies relocated to Will Willamette University with the Claremont School of Theology. However, as the Institute evolved during its first year, it became apparent that the name didn't quite express who we are as well as who what we wanted it to. So our philosophical foundation is based primarily on the process philosophy developed by English mathematician, Alfred North Whitehead. And it was taught by John Cobb at the Claremont School of Theology. It emphasizes interconnectedness, interbecoming, and the need for an ecological civilization. This thinking asks us to care about our world and everything contained in it from trees, to elephants, to stars and stones. We belong to and are intertwined in a delicate balance that is held together in beautiful harmony. And you and I are part of that harmony. This understanding calls us to do what we can for the common good. Our original name, Claremont, School, uh, Claremont Institute for Process Studies did a good job of indicating our commitment to process philosophy but it didn't capture our commitment to living out ideas and ideal, ideals in our daily practice. So in honor of our founder and to more adequately articulate our multifaceted focus, we became the Cobb Institute, a community for process and practice. Our work involves collaboration with local cities for sustainability through urban gardening, promotion of justice in new and innovative forms such as community banking and restorative practices. We embrace diversity and encourage both traditional and novel expressions of spirituality. We all matter, the world matters, and each day is a new opportunity to make a difference. For details on the work we do and to join us for any of our events or sacred work, please check out our website and contact us at cob.institute. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. And now, uh, John Luigi, would you introduce Matthew to us? Uh, so many of us are so indebted to him and influenced by him. Um, 
please remind us of who right. he is and how he's helping us all. It's hard to be sure, but I, try, I will try. Uh, Matthew started uh, as a Dominican in the Catholic Church, and uh, he was always interested in lived religion or spirituality or the kernel of what it means to be uh, religious in any way. And one of the sentences that um, impressed me early before I actually met him in person was that God is our own experience of God. And for me, like uh, uh, being at the time already a trained uh, academic theologian, uh, it was a shock because all my brain went into a frenzy and thinking, oh my God, experience, the category of experience is so complicated. How can we use this category in theology? <laughs> it converted me to that kind of uh, directedness, which is, matters so much for the world today. God is our experience of God. I, I, this is one of many sentences that I could use to, 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 to introduce him as his motto. Mm. But uh, it, it's kind of a, a warrior cry that led him to, um, to become so popular and also for, for his battles, his battles within the Catholic Church and at the time of the reign of John Paul II and Ratzinger. Uh, that led him to create, to found the University of Creation Spirituality and many other institutions after that, to write more than 40 books, among which uh, Original Blessing is perhaps his first famous one, translated in so many languages. I had the honor to do the translation of that book in Italian. The Coming of the Cosmic Christ and many, many other books. He keeps writing, he just told me that he just finished the book on Julian of Norwich one of his main uh, merits really has been that of reintroducing uh, medieval Western mystics to a large uh, audience. And uh, one of his latest books, not the last one, is this one on the names of God. So God, name God, name God, naming the unusual names of God, including the unnameable God. And Estelle Frankel writes this about it. Naming the unnameable offer a smogger's board of spiritual delight that will enrich the prayer life of both believers and non-believers. Fox's radiant images and creative appellations transform the generic God into a vibrant, intimate source for personal communion. Even those who have abandoned conventional religion will find wisdom and inspiration in these beautifully articulated reflections. Well, thank you so much. You that so gives much. us a good feel. And uh, Kathleen, if you would say a word about John Cobb, please. Well, John Cobb is a theologian, a philosopher, an environmentalist. He is often regarded as the preeminent scholar in the field of process philosophy and process theology. John is the author of more than 50 books. And in 2014, he was elected to the prestigious American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And for this introduction, I could keep listing his academic accomplishments, but that would do nothing to tell you of who John Cobb really is. So what I want you to know about John is that he's 95 years old and he's still active nonstop in environmental ethics and other social issues because he cares about this planet and its future. He has been speaking about the environment even before 1971 when his groundbreaking book in environmental ethics was released. The book entitled, Is It Too Late? A Theology of Ecology argued for the relevance of religious thought in approaching um, the ecological crisis. And what I wanna tell you about John Cobb is that he is so beloved by his former students and he's inspired many of them to join him in his work toward a better world. He inspires people and he puts them to work to create a better future. There are schools named in his honor in China where he has planted seeds of hope for building an ecologically healthy civilization. He's a retired professor, but he remains a teacher. And in this capacity, he is a teacher for us all. He inspires new students like me to work for a better world. He is direct, honest, and urgent. He doesn't sugarcoat his message, but he offers us hope 
and his message is an important one. And I'm honored to introduce Dr. John B. Cobb, Jr. Thank you so much, Kathleen. And, and here we go. And both John Cobb and Matthew Fox have done so much to orient our lives toward what we might call an ecological civilization. And let that be a phrase for living with respect and care for the community of life, for a kind of macro consciousness, but also a kind of micro consciousness, attention to local realities, local possibilities for just, sustainable, joyful, and spiritually alive communities. What I'd like to hear from you, Matthew, and also from you, John, at first, is just um, your understanding of how it began for you, this hope, this dream, this passion. Um, did it begin at home, family life, experiences in the natural world, church, none of the above, all of the above? <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your story and how you became you. Matthew, would you go first? Sure. But first, I want to um, thank you, Jay, and for uh, all of you involved here to bringing uh, John and me together. It's always a pleasure and a joy and a learning experience to interact with John, who, whose work I admire. Um, and Alfred North Whitehead, whom he incarnates so beautifully, whose work and person I admire. One of Whitehead's favorite phrases, or my favorite phrase from Whitehead is the one about how religion without adventure is already dead. Uh, I like the word adventure. So as far as my own baptism into ecology, it began very early. I grew up in Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin. And it was a city then of just 65,000, but it was a capital city as it still is. But uh, there was a lot of nature in, in the city and and all around us because Wisconsin is very much a, a farming area. And the presence of the Native Americans is very strong still on the land. When I was a child, I had many dreams that were Native American dreams. But we had four lakes within the city limits and there was in the summer canoeing and swimming and fishing and all that. In the winter there was ice skating and, and um, even ice boats, <laughs> that was wild, and ice fishing. Not that I did it, but I watched other crazy people do it. <laughs> but you had all four seasons back then in Wisconsin. I'm not sure they do today because of climate change, but I mean, winters were so severe. I remember once we couldn't get out our front door. We had to go up the second floor because the snow was so high. Mm -hmm. So it was thrilling as a child. And my parents, I was one of seven children, my parents for especially my mother was all for getting us outdoors and, and doing things in, the, in, in nature. And uh, so I grew up in that context that was very green in every sense of the word. Uh, even today, when I go back to Wisconsin, since I've been living in California for over 35 years, the green just overwhelms me. It's just stunning. So that was a big part of my spirituality growing up. And so too was church. And I especially loved Saturday mass because Saturday mass was always dedicated to the goddess, to Mary. They didn't call her the goddess, but I've learned since that she is a goddess. And, um, and all the readings were from, from wisdom literature. It's interesting that Gigi talked about his, his exciting uh, program as focusing on wisdom. Well, wisdom, I, I, I just love those readings that would I'd hear on Saturday, not on Sunday, <laughs> but on Saturday. The readings like, I, I walk on the vaults of the sky and on the sands of the deep. Or I was by God's side, a master, master craft person, praying with God day after day, delighting to be with the sons and daughters of the human race. These marvelous, marvelous wisdom scriptures. Uh, they move me, especially as an adolescent. Oh, yeah, I played football and I did the things boys do as adolescents. But um, this touched something different in me, something deep. Now, of course, I have a name for it. It's, it's mysticism and it's feminism. 
And to know that there is this feminine tradition within our, our Christian tradition is, is very important. Um, and I'm glad that uh, Gigi's uh, center is focusing on the wisdom. And of course, today's scholarship tells us that Jesus himself, the historical Jesus, comes from the wisdom tradition. And the wisdom tradition of Israel is about finding God in nature, not in a book and not in a building, but in nature. In fact, many scholars believe that Jesus was considered illegitimate in his village. So in the synagogue, he wasn't allowed in. I mean, on the Sabbath, he wasn't allowed in the synagogue to pray. So he went out into nature to pray. And that is pretty obvious from his parables, his teachings, so much of it is steeped in an acute observation of nature. And of course, as a teenager, he apprenticed with John the Baptist in the desert. And in Jesus' day, in the desert, there were lions. So as a teenager, Jesus was learning how to live with lions in the desert with this wild man, John the Baptist. So, you know, we can so easily forget that Jesus was shamanistic in so many ways, and uh, even in his training uh, under uh, John the Baptist in the pivotal years of one's adolescence. So um, when I studied in Paris in the late 60s, my mentor was Pere, uh, Marie uh, uh, da Dominic Chenu, Pere Chenu, C-H-E-N-U, wonderful French scholar, very an activist, very important in the Second Vatican Council. He had been silenced by Pope Pius XII for 12 years, forbidden to write. And he's the grandfather of liberation theology. But I'll never forget the time in class when he, he mentioned for the first time, I never heard it, there are these two traditions in Christianity. There's the original sin tradition, and there is the creation-centered tradition. And that just woke me up, because at that time, 1968, I was wrestling, as so much of my generation was, with the relationship between politics and spirituality. We had the anti-Vietnam War thing, the the um, civil rights movements and so forth. And uh, this just named it for me that this, if you begin with creation and not with the human, which is what any sin oriented theology does, you're, you're first of all, leaving out 13.8 billion years of history and God's work unfolding of the universe, but also you're committing to anthropocentrism. And what a downer that is. If I just had to depend on human beings you know, I would have been depressed beyond measure um, decades ago. But it is nature that causes us to our bigger selves, the sun, the moon, the stars, and the story of how we got here. And our stories have collapsed. And so we need new mythology. We need new stories. And this creation story from science today really isn't that different from Genesis 1. I swear, all those who put sin as a starting point for religion have had the first page of their Bible written, torn out. The first page of the Bible is cosmology. It's a theory on how, how the universe came to be. But above all, it's a declaration of how good creation is and how very good it is. Even when the humans come on, creation is called very good. Well, that's what I mean by original blessing. And it astounds me to this day that two popes um, didn't get it. <laughs> that we move, trying to move from uh, human-oriented, sin-oriented, because only humans sin, beginning point for religion, to a praise-oriented and an original blessing understanding that this universe has birthed this amazing planet and all this amazing species, of which we humans are, are one, but only one. So um, all this fits for my growing up as a child. This fits the wisdom literature I heard in church, and it fits uh, the experiences, the deep experiences I had all through my childhood uh, in nature. And so, um, so I was, um, what can I say, ready and armed <laughs> when the ecological movement came along. <clears throat> well, thank you so much, and what, what, what good stories. What good stories. Mm -hmm. uh, John Cobb, how about for you? Uh, how did all this begin for you? Well, I, I think I should say that I was brought up as a pietist with the social gospel. And pietism and social gospel were combined in the Methodist tradition, but neither of them was 
and both of them were anthropocentric. That did not mean that we didn't care about nature, but we thought, I mean, at least I, I love to sing for the beauty of the earth. I, I love to just feel the, the in, in the hills in Japan, uh, when, where we went in the summer, we were in nature in a way we were not the rest of the year. I just loved it. But it didn't occur to me that that was something to thematize or focus on. So I, I did not break out of the anthropocentrism in um, the way in which Matthew did until later. And my, uh, my first crisis was when I went to the University of Chicago after I'd been in the army for three and a half years. And um, even though uh, I was deeply impressed and drawn by Charles Hartshorn, and I'm very interested in what he was doing. Nevertheless, the uh, exposure to modernity was uh, sh shocking to me. I, I mean, I went there in order to test, so I don't mean shocking in the sense of totally unexpected. But I found myself being drawn into modernity, and from my point of view, Modernity and Christian faith are simply incompatible. Um, the modern world understands that, well, I'll, I'll put it in the very simple way that most, most individuals wouldn't want, but nevertheless it dominates, that we explain everything by matter and motion. There's no place for anything beyond that. So. Uh, that was the issue I went to Chicago to work on, and uh, I had my a kind of death of God experience, very painfully, but nature wasn't part of that. Um, but the uh, I, I transferred from. <clears throat> the program on the study of the analysis of ideas and the study of method was the program I enrolled in at Chicago. Uh, I transferred to the Divinity School because I, I knew that there, there were people who understood the modern world and uh, had made some kind of adjustment to it or counterculturally. And uh, it was a wonderful time to go because Bernie Luma, who was dean, had the same spirit that the college had, and I think the university as a whole, that the purpose of education was to think. And um, I, that's what I needed, and I'm very, very grateful for it. In any case, the the general process movement they, they in the divinity school they called it neo naturalism so it certainly included the whole of the world I would never anthropocentric in in a way of assuming human beings were separate from from the natural world that has always seemed like nonsense to me but. Um, the, I, I did not become focused upon the natural world until I was utterly shocked by the news that it was unsus that our, our human lives were making it unsustainable. So I became focused upon nature only when I discovered that nature was not something I could take for granted. It wasn't just permanently given. It was something that we humans were engaged in destroying. And that was not only a kind of intellectual, but I mean, I loved nature, <laughs> even if I hadn't thematized it. 
and to realize what we were doing to it was a deep, deep shock. And I have not over gotten out of that shock. But uh, I think that for me, um, history is the context within which I think about everything. Um, so my I was very interested in what Matthew said about Jesus. And obviously, I always took it for granted that Jesus appreciated the natural world as part of God's waking and presence. But I had, I had not been aware of how possible it is to understand him it's in the shamanistic tradition. That is not the direction I've gone. I, I understand Jesus' mission Jesus' understanding of his mission to be to save Israel and to save Israel from itself in the sense that uh, it was, there had been violence, re revolts already, and uh, the likelihood of more violent revolts was there. And, and he was called as Messiah to so there's another way of resisting an unjust rule. So today, I think that we are called to save the world. And that means, of course, it's some things which are just purely human, uh, economics of hu human economics is very important for human beings. But uh, what threatens the world is the incapa incapacity of nature that we have created. And we have made nature un unable to sustain itself. Uh, I, don't, I don't think this is so much a matter. Of, I mean, I'm, I'm not preoccupied with sin. I never, I've, I've never built on that. The social gospel was very much aware of the evils of the world, but um, they, they were to be dealt with by new policies. Of course, we we called we understood we were sinners, but I just mean that was not my preoccupation. So, whereas Matt has spiritually. Uh, become one with nature and I, I admire and appreciate that. M my view is more a, an historical view that history itself may be near its end and the reason for that is because we are totally, have been totally irresponsible in relation to nature. I personally just took for granted that nature would always be nature. And uh, I no, no longer take that for granted. I have not for the last 50 years. So uh, we, we have come to this in quite, in quite different ways. But that doesn't mean, uh, at least from my point of view, it doesn't, doesn't mean I don't want Matt to do what Matt does. Mm -hmm. It's just not what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. Matthew, uh, would you like to respond a little bit to this part of, of our discussion, and we'll turn to some other things. Anything John said that you would like to respond to now? Well, I, I appreciate uh, very much hearing more of John's story, including his personal story and his summers in Japan. That was uh, exciting to hear about, and his love of nature. And, um, uh, and of course, his approach in terms of of raising these social issues, the structural issues. Uh, I know that we're gonna get into these things in more detail as we move along. And to me, that's eminently important too. I'm not just about getting high on nature. I am about trying to defend it. Um, this new order that we established, the order of the sacred earth, everyone takes a vow that says, I promise to be the best lover of mother earth and the best defender of mother earth that I can be. So. For me, the lover in us is the mystic, and there's a mystic in all of us, a lover in all of us, 
And the prophet in us is the defender or the warrior, a defending Mother Earth. So um, I think, you know, John and I, as he says, we come from different places. I was raised Catholic and he was raised Methodist and we're a different generation too. So our experiences <coughs> were different along the way. So like I was coming of age at the time of civil rights and the time of the ecological movement. Um, a lot of my study and love in study has been of the pre-moderns. Um, by that, I mean the medieval mystics, Hildegard being in Francis of Assisi, Thomas Aquinas, and Mechthild of Magdeburg, Meister Eckhart, and now Julian of Norwich, because the pre-modern consciousness begins with the universe. Whether you're Native American or you're one of those great mystics of the Christian tradition in the Middle Ages, you began with the universe, you didn't begin with the human. And that's the point, I think, for talking about original blessing in distinction from original sin. The Bible too, being pre-modern, begins with the universe, not with the human. Humans come along another chapter. And it's not always a pretty story, as we know. So um, definitely we want to get into this discussion about where we go from here and the battles we're involved in today. Um, uh, and history is, is eminently important to me. My mentor, Per Chanu, was in the great historians of uh, Christian history. And that's why he had such an impact on the Second Vatican Council um, and on, on liberation theology as well as Christian spirituality because he, he had, and he certainly bequeathed to me, this um, great appreciation, for example, the, the 12th century. Um, he says the Renaissance of the 12th century was the only successful Renaissance in the West. He thinks the 16th century Renaissance has been inflated <laughs> because it was top down. He said the 12th century Renaissance was from the bottom up. It was the serfs and young people and women who launched this revolution and it was a revolution. And it reinvented education, it reinvented religion, uh, it reinvented um, our relationship to science and so forth. And of course, he spent his whole life bringing science, as John Cobb has done through Whitehead and so forth, into the Christian uh, faith. And he took hits for it, tremendous hits for it. He was condemned three times after he died uh, because of his stand on consubstantiality of body and soul. In other words, <clears throat> that there, we cannot make a dualism of matter and spirit or body and soul. And for that, he was condemned three times before they canonized him as saint. So he's one of my great heroes. In fact, there's a painting of him right here, which is on the cover of my recent book on Aquinas. But, um, and I know that, that John and I are in this same world together, bringing science and religion together, science and healthy religion. That's why I use the word spirituality because a lot of religion, a lot of what calls itself Christianity, um, is, is, is far from it. So um, anyway, I, I really enjoyed hearing John's perspective, but I want him to know that I'm not um, outside his circle at all. I think we're, we're in this together. And of course, John has frequently worked with Brian Swin, the cosmologist, who's a student of Thomas Berry, who uh, I think the two of them are helping us to, to celebrate and to develop this new myth this new creation story from science, but to see it through the eyes of the sacred, because that's the bottom line uh, for this struggle that John and I and so many today are on board for. This wonderful line from Thomas Berry in his foreword to a book on Thomas Merton's Meditations on Nature. Thomas Berry says, people say that we will not love, we will not save what we do not love, but we will neither love nor save what we do not consider as sacred. So that's the bottom line for me. We have to see nature as sacred, as something bigger than ourselves that's invited us on board after 13.8 billion years. And it's an amazing place to be. And there's work to do, as John says. I think, Matthew, uh, ending on that notion of work to do, just, uh, just a, a note before I raise the next question. Uh, Matthew, you may know that some process theologians and philosophers speak of their perspective as constructive postmodernism, not destructive postmodernism, but constructive. And constructive postmodernism involves reclaiming 
and remembering uh, the best of the pre-modern past. Hmm. And that particular phrase, construct of postmodernism, is the one used in China, in mainland China. Oh. Um, so right. how to claim the best of Taoism, hmm. Chinese Buddhism, and the, the agrarian traditions, and, hmm. and say yes to that, and yet move forward. Uh, probably one thing unique about constructive postmodernism, a la John Cobb, is the role that science plays. And so that was not part of pre-modern. So how to wed the pre-modern intuitions with science. Now you mentioned Thomas Berry and the great work. Um, I'd like to turn to you and to John Cobb. I know that many people watching this are saying, uh, what can I do? What can I do? And sometimes they mean that as an individual. They may, may mean it as a family. They may, may mean it as a peoplehood, as a local community, as a nation. And I'm wondering if you would like to just spend a little time imagining that person who comes to you and says, what can I do? And, and how would you respond? Sure. Let me first just play off just for a second the point you made about the constructive. I really like that understanding, constructive postmodernism, because a lot of postmodernists are busy deconstructing. Right. I say they're like little little boys with a watch. They can take it apart, but <laughs> they can't put it back together. And, you know, that's, what good is that? That just creates a lot of fracas. Um, but I want to stress that you just said that the, the pre-moderns, the agri-based agri communities didn't have science, but that's what I was... That's what I make about Aquinas. He did have mm -hmm. science. The mm -hmm. science for him was Aristotle. Aristotle was a, was a huge discovery in the 12th, late 12th century. And it came through Islam. And he was pagan. And this is why there is such a flack from fundamentalists in Aquinas day as there is today. Who needs a pagan telling us what, what God has made? Who needs a pagan who comes to us through Islam? That was a complaining. But Aquinas stepped away from nine 800 years of theology, which favored Plato, who was utterly dualistic and was incarnated by Augustine in the West, who was utterly, utterly dualistic. Augustine said the soul makes war with the body. That's dualistic. Hmm. So my point is to show that, but there was some pre-modern science. And many scientific scholars will say, I just read recently that, um, Aquinas' mentor, Albert the Great, who was a scientist and who introduced Aquinas in a deep way to Aristotle, um, a scientist historian said, if the West had followed Albert the Great, contemporary science would have started 400 years before it did. Mm -hmm. So I do not agree that in the Western tradition, science was dead in the Middle Ages. It was not. And, um, and that was Aquinas's, he, he was the epitome of this quest, this intellectual curiosity. He said a mistake about creation results in a mistake about God. Therefore, we have to go to scientists. So that was his philosophy. I just want to stress that Aquinas was an absolute genius and, and courageous beyond belief to do what he did and to do it so alone. Now, about where we go from here, even personally and otherwise, um, well, first of all, personally, I think people have to fall in love. It's like John said, we can't take nature for granted anymore. Here I am in Northern California for 25 straight days. We didn't see the sun. We didn't see the sky. And we were breathing in this bad air, which we've now shipped east. Others are getting it too. We're all interconnected after all. One scientist said the air in, at that time was equivalent to smoking 25 packs of cigarettes. So the ecocide we're involved in, and I call it matricide, the killing of Mother Earth. It comes from a deep place within us. It's not just happening. It's part of what patriarchy has done to our souls. It has cut us off from nature at a radical, deep, deep place. And we think we're here to control nature or we think we're here just to take from nature, eat all we can and all the rest. That's a spiritual problem. We're not gonna solve this ecocide and matricide without redoing our inner lives. And it means, first of all, that we fall in love all over again 
with the beauty of the world around us, with beautiful skies. And, and quit mouthing these shibboleths that we love our children, love our grandchildren, if we're not actively involved in deconstructing those structures and ways of thinking that have brought us to this place. And I include in that certainly education. I think education is one of the biggest culprits in this whole situation. Tuesday, we're having presidential debate and they released the six questions that Wallace is gonna ask the two presidential candidates and not one question is about climate change. And here we are, 200,000 people have died of coronavirus in our country alone. And the cause of coronavirus is climate change. We're not talking about the cause. Say nothing of these wildfires out here or the fact that a whole continent, Australia was in fire last summer and the last presidential debates, 2016, there was not one question from the journalists about climate change. So I say, the, what schools did these journalists go to? They should all be shut down and started over with values, with values. That's why Albert Einstein said, I abhor American education. That's Einstein, why? Because there are no values. And when there are no values taught, what that tells everybody is, oh, I can be a lawyer, I can be a scientist, I can be a preacher, I can be whatever I want and, and just go for the, for the prize. As if there is no common good. Now, John Cobb with others wrote a wonderful book on community and the common good years ago. Do you know who first used the word common good in the West? Thomas Aquinas, <laughs> and he repeats it hundreds of times. And the key to common good, he says, is justice, and good law. Justice is, in, good law is an expression of justice, and that means <laughs> eco justice, as well as racial justice, gender justice, social justice. There could be no common good without justice. There's no justice without common good. Instead, you get a party of crazy lawyers arguing till they die and making money all the way to the grave. So we need a reinvention of all our institutions. And this begins in the heart with people, if you love your children or grandchildren, it's not, it's, not, it's not just a feeling thing, it's an action thing. And you have to think it through and strategy and see what's killing your children and grandchildren and will be killing their children and grandchildren. And see that we are killing the earth and replace matricide, matricide with a respect of the mother, a respect of the divine feminine. This has to return if we're gonna survive as a species. Patriarch, patriarchy has been running our culture for thousands of years and has gotten us to this place. We are paying the bill, our generation, if you will. We're finally waking up to this, but we have a long way to go. But it begins in the heart, but it extends to our minds and our work and all our professions need reinventing, including religious ones. Uh, Matthew, as you, as you were talking there, I know John Cobb well enough to where I said, is this John Cobb talking or is this Matthew Fox talking? <laughs> um, it, 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 it's, there's so much, so much re resonance. Uh, John, I think you might want to respond a little bit to what Matthew just said, it, piggyback and it, say what you'd like to say, extend it, whatever. Yeah. Would you respond to Matthew? Well, th th that question of what to do about it is what I've been worrying about for 50 years. And... Uh, of course, it, in one sense, it all depends upon the deep commitments internal to individuals and how individuals see it and so forth. But I, I think we have to work directly upon institutions. And uh, I, don't, I don't hear Matt contradicting that. I'm just saying it's a different ac accent. I start with trying to uh, deconstruct institutions, and and uh, he, he he comes to that from another place. So uh, economics is number one. I think that the uh, theories of economics that uh, have been adopted by modernity, partly because of their consistency with the principles of modern science 
which emphasize individuality, substantiality, separateness. Um, modern economics is, is, has in fact become the ruling theology of our world. And it is a terrible theology. And none of us believe it. Yeah. Nevertheless, we follow it. And um, I think that just has to be, re it, it has to be attacked. And I've been trying to do that for a long time. And um, ecological economics and other forms of economics around the fringes are threatening it. It's um, even the people who teach it don't really believe it. <laughs> But uh, it, if if it rules policy making, uh, that it's still we can't just say oh well we don't need to worry they don't believe it they do. anyway that's one area in which I think there has been progress but universities still built around the economic model. And universities do more harm than good. Mm. So education is the other thing. I was at Chicago during the time that the Wissenschaften, that is what we call academic disciplines, were taking over modern education. Mm. And the president of, of, of Chicago was resisting so Chicago still thought that the life of the mind was important. And of course, the life of the mind and the quest for wisdom requires that values be front and center. Mm -hmm. Values without facts are of course nothing. There'd be no way of applying them. They'd just be some kinds of abstractions to which one might give mental uh, acquiescence, but facts without values are nothing. There are no facts without values. The the philosopher who sent us on the wrong direction here was Immanuel Kant. Hmm. And Immanuel Kant is the most influential philosopher of the modern world. Hmm. And uh, I think that we have to have to say that that's wrong. And edu to build an educational system around that lie. I, I don't mean that, I, I'm not interested in personal criticism. I'm talking about theories, the, the Kantian theory. It happens that Kant himself wrote a third critique. And if we had built upon the third critique, we would be so much better off, but we built primarily upon the first critique. And the first critique says you can separate the facts from values. So I, I, I'm interested in many, many other changes, but I think um, withdrawing one's support from the economic system and withdrawing one's support from the educational system is something everybody can do. That doesn't mean you can escape being involved in it. But when people just act as if this was, the, the, obviously the economists know more about economics. No, they don't. <laughs> the educators know more about education. I keep reminding people there's a very influential book addressed to professors. Save the world on your own time. That is not what your job is as a professor. <laughs> your job as a professor is to add to a body of value-free facts mm -hmm. in one particular compartment separated from other compartments. Well, that's a, that does more harm than good. Mm -hmm. So I I have very strong feelings, but to, when when the person asks me what can they do, I obviously need to know a lot lot more about that individual before. 
before giving an answer. Mm. I think at the present time that lots of people could start talking about the importance of using our schools to respond to the crisis that humanity and the whole living system face. I, I think most people can understand that. And if we said that's what we want our schools to do, and then you look at what our schools do, they say, well, all right, well, we better get on school boards. We better, you know, there are things people can do about education. But it's so much easier to try to succeed in the present system than it is to try to create another system. But it's got to be done. And I, it's too late, of course, to save us from really terrible consequences. We are already, when you think how many species have disappeared forever. And now when you think of the weather that we are already just beginning a little bit to experience the horrors of climate change. It's too late to avoid that now. We have we have not succeeded in getting attention. And the, uh, there was, I keep telling people, there was a brief period around 1970, and in the very early 70s, when the popular opinion was sufficiently concerned about the unsustainability of society that we actually got some good legislation through Congress and signed by Nixon. But the um, powers that be saw that this way it might lead to a reduction of their profits. And so they persuaded us that we all needed to tackle one particular problem or another. And once they once they did that, then we no longer had a, a global, a, a common movement. And each one could be dismissed as special interest. There has been no good legislation since 1973. Mm. The best we've been able to do is to defend what we accomplished then, which was just the beginning of what we needed to do. So for 50 years, watching how uh, our masters, the great financial institutions and the great transnational corporations have prevented us from doing what we needed in order to, in order simply to have a continuing human history. It's been, it's painful. Matthew, do you, do you want to respond to anything that John has just said before we turn to a slightly different topic? Well, I love all of it. <laughs> I've been nodding my head all along. Um, Thomas Berry says the two greatest failures of the 20th century were education and religion. Now, my whole adult life has been serving in both those arenas, <laughs> and I couldn't agree more with him. <clears throat> But I didn't serve passively in either. <clears throat> when you take on the Vatican, you, you, um, <clears throat> what can I say? You're not serving passively. <laughs> uh, one person said taking on the Vatican is like standing in front of a train. But um, regarding education, I figured out real early, back in 1976 or so, that you can't do spirituality in a Western model of education that I had to reinvent education in, in the programs that I created. And so I did. I acknowledge that we have, if you will, two hemispheres of the brain. So we should be training both, not just one, not just the rational side. And so um, I developed this pedagogy of artist meditation, bringing artists in and doing, now we do seminars in the morning. So that's your left brain work books read, books, articles written, or papers written, and all that, a dialogue, debate about ideas. But the afternoon, we do meditation as, uh, for example, dance is meditation, or clay is meditation, or painting, and so on. And this is not frivolous. 
This is getting to the soul. This is how the right brain learns. This is how intuition comes to the fore. And this is where values are. Einstein said values are not found in the intellect. He said, do not overvalue the intellect. Values are found in the intuition. And so bringing intuition alive is a, has been my pedagogy for over 45 years. And we've had amazing results. Walter Brueggemann, a great biblical scholar, in his marvelous book, The Prophetic Imagination, makes the same point, that imagination is what the prophetic feeds on and is how it relates to the community and gets the community to wake up and to change. So that's what artist meditation is all about. It's called the way of the prophets, according to two psychologists, Naranjo and another who wrote a book on psychology meditation in the 70s. So if we're not doing artist meditation, what are we doing? to awaken that intuition where the values reside. And of course, the mystics too, awake our intuition where the values ar arise. So that should be an integral part of education. And I'll just give two wonderful examples of our students. One was an engineer. He came into the program. He said, I've been teaching engineering for 27 years. I'm burned out by academia and engineering. Two weeks into our program, he came to me and said, I've got my soul back. Now that sentence is really interesting. Here's a 27-year professor who lost his soul in his work, but he got it back in two weeks. He went back to his university, University of Colorado, and started Engineers Without Borders, which now has 18,000 members, doing all these wonderful things in Haiti and the Amazon and Africa and Afghanistan, helping people to generate, uh, a, you know, elect. Uh, electrically operated, the sun operated uh, systems of irrigation, all the other miracles, marvels that engineers can do. But he told me two years ago, it all came from that experience in your program. Another example of a graduate, Sister Dorothy Stang. Sister Dorothy Stang was a Catholic missionary in the Amazon for 42 years. She took a sabbatical around her 40th year and joined my program. She went back and it, Two years later, she was martyred. She was gunned down by three people with machine guns who represented the plantation owners in the Amazon who are still at it, burning down the Amazon, driving indigenous people out and all the rest. And she was advised not to return, that her life is in danger because she was a leader, but she said, I have to return to the people, the forest and the forest itself, etc." So she was genuinely a martyr. And her brothers who knew her well said she got her courage upped by going through our program and especially Hildegard of Bingen became so important to her that she sustained her in her struggle. So these mystics, they accompany us and these prophets in, and they build our courage and courage is so needed today. So um, I can't agree more, more with um, John Cobb that um, uh, Education is part of the problem. Now, economics. I just want to point out one important truth, fact about economics in America that we don't connect. Black lives matter. You see, slavery was an economic thing. <laughs> it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, it didn't start as racism. It started as we're gonna make more money if we get free labor and let's go to Africa and steal human beings and make them work for us. And of course, around that economic decision, and I can't emphasize it enough, around that economic decision, of course, you built uh, a, whole, a whole ideology of racism because how else could you justify uh, treating human beings the way your slaves were being treated? So slavery is an economic process. And yeah, we did something about it in the Civil War, and for a while with, with um, uh, after the Civil War. But you know, we've had 2000 senators in American history and 10 have been black. And three, only three senators today are black. So economics then, as John is saying, is the basic idolatry of our culture. And so politics wraps itself around our economics. And so the gerrymandering, the making it almost impossible for people to vote, all these things, the Jim Crow laws, but even today, the return of, 
of new strategies to prevent voting in uh, minority groups, Black Lives Matter as a response. All this is about economics, which leads to bad politics and to terrible um, religion. So um, yeah, I, I fully agree. And you know, I think Pope Francis has done a very good job in taking on what he calls the idolatry of money in our time and, and what's going on in Wall Street. We all know that Wall Street made off like bandits with the last recession and Main Street is left paying the bills. Not only that, of course, the billionaire class has had, uh, because of its influence, uh, new laws that relieve it of taxes, significant of corporations, huge, hugest corporations that are paying no tax. So us ordinary folks are paying for all the streets and the schools and, and the health care, which we deprive so many of, et cetera. So yeah, the whole thing blows up when you start looking critically at economics. And that's why we have to go back to the idea of the common good. The common good is about justice. It's about balance. It's about fairness. And, and uh, that's the struggle. And uh, it, it's, it's a perpetual struggle. I mean, you can see it in, in the Psalms. In, in, in the old days and in Jewish history, where the, the widows and the orphans go unattended to. And the Bible says, and the whole earth is off kilter. It's the pillars of the earth are broken. The whole cosmos is collapsing. And that's what's happening, of course, with the eco-crisis. And, and Hildegard warned us in this 12th century, she said, we live in a, a web of creation. But if human greed, if human greed uh, and injustice take over, then God will allow creation to punish humanity. So if we, if we destroy this web, now a web is a flexible thing. It's not a rigid thing. It's flexible and it's strong. But we are capable with our advanced uh, intelligence and low morality, we are capable of rendering that renting that web and when that happens creation is going to come and get us and i think that's the coronavirus that's aids aids came from monkeys in africa coronavirus comes from bats in china because we've invaded the habitats of these other creatures because we think we're so superior one last point aquinas says the most excellent thing in the universe is not the human the most excellent thing in the universe is the universe itself. And we are all here, he says, to serve the universe. And this is why Thomas Berry can say that ecology is functional cosmology. Ecology is our, our home, how we treat our mother earth and, and other creatures on it and ourselves in, the, in that context. But all of this is cosmology at work too. <clears throat> Thank you, Matthew. Uh, we do have a couple of questions, and I'd like to to share them with you, but also ask you to to answer somewhat briefly because we've got two more topics we want to talk about before we close this. One was for John Cobb. John, you mentioned the third critique, uh, but you didn't say anything about it. Kant's third critique. Do you want to say just a word about that and why you wish it had been heeded, taken more seriously? Well, I. I wish I could tell you that I had read it, and that I, but it is a, it is focused on aesthetics, mm -hmm. and the aesthetic approach seems, in a way, even for Kant to be able to subsume the others. Mm -hmm. So I think it it doesn't leave you with the radical dualism of the first two critiques, mm -hmm. but it has had very little influence. Perhaps it had an influence on Schelling. I'm not, I, I, but I'm not an authority on that. Okay, okay. So the and main thing I have to just confess is it is not, it's not been a part of my education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And even the discovery that there was a third critique is relatively recent. <laughs> 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 but I'm sure Kant thought it was very important, you know. I mean, he was, he had done the first two critiques and he felt the need of something else and he was right. <laughs> I, I, I'm just saying it's not, I'm not attacking Kant. I'm just attacking the, the ideas that uh, the adoption of the notion 
that facts can be studied without bringing any value into the picture. It, it, it's never done. It, mm. it, it's always done. I, I don't, and the universities are all, I mean, if you really took seriously the fact that there are no values, then of course anybody could cheat and there wouldn't be any problem about it. But I don't know a university that says, oh, it doesn't matter whether you cheat or not. Mm. That gets right into the classroom. So it's consistency, I suppose, one should not hope for. But there's too much consistency about this idea that you want to have facts without values, <laughs> rather than too little. It, it's really a, a, a terrible doctrine, it has awful consequences. And it's, unless we can unless we can persuade the educators that their task is to really help human beings, students beginning with the students and you're not students are not helped by being taught that values play no role mm. and that is not helpful mm -hmm. it's it's spiritually destructive mm -hmm. and uh it's my my approach is really to try to persuade people the crisis is simply too great to lock up inside of an institution that prides itself on being irrelevant. <laughs> Much of the best, most intelligent people we have. That, that's just such a waste. It's worse than a waste. Well, I'm, I, I, I do get impatient. I just don't understand. And I don't hear anybody giving an explanation that makes any sense at all. It's just habit. That's what we do. Academic disciplines exist. Guilds exist. You can't challenge them. They require disciplines. That's what they do. They require that the disciplines be value-free. So, that's fact. Okay, we can't evaluate it. So you get inside that system. You can't criticize it. It's so much worse than the church ever was. <laughs> that I get so tired of the critique of dog, dogmatic religion when dogmatic theories that govern it and cannot be discussed. As the dogmas of the church, there have always been people who criticize them. But you, the criticism is unimaginable. Anyway, I'm... I'm, I'm glad we're working on the same problems and we, we approach them from a, from a different place, but, but I think we both get to almost everything that the other one like is interested in. So I have not the slightest interest in converting you to something different. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew, uh, I'm going to give you a question directed to you, but first, just a remark. Uh, when I was taking uh, Whitehead's philosophy under John Cobb, I was also reading Original Blessing. And so that early book and Whitehead's process and reality were hand in hand for me. And what I certainly sensed in Original Blessing and much of what you've said thereafter is along with Thomas Berry, you see the universe as a community of subjects, not just a collection of objects. And 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 all the living beings and all the actualities aren't just facts. They're also values and they're to be respected. And actually that was what Whitehead was saying as well in his way, more abstractly. One thing that you did that I really appreciated and still appreciate is you added um, an experiential component. Uh, you added liturgy. Uh, you, you invited people to dance their way into that understanding of the universe as a community of subjects, a community of subjects, not just a collection of objects. So I really see you as enriching the process tradition. That's just a, an observation. Um, but now I'll give you your question. It's going to take you back a little bit to those Catholic days. So here comes. One person, one person wrote, I feel that the main salvation for, for preserving the planet 
is to lower the population. The earth cannot support seven plus billion people. Now here's the question. What are the Catholics and the Pope's view on contraception? That's from our YouTube audience. You want to speak to that in short, in a short way? Well, you see, the, the Catholic Church, unfortunately, has clung to St. Augustine for 16 centuries. And it's St. Augustine who was so down on sexuality that he said, whenever you make love, you have to uh, make it possible for a baby to come along. And that's the only purpose of having sex is to make babies. So it's ridiculous. You want my opinion on it? It's ridiculous. And it's more than that. It's dangerous, as, as this person is saying, that we there are enough humans around. <laughs> and uh, we should put our energy into upping the quality of human and, and human education, as John and I are both talking about, and, and developing values, because all that is, is hard work. And, um, and creating the virtues, the inner disciplines, which are the basis of values, and that, that cross over all religions and people of no religion, that to survive, humans have to develop inner uh, practices, uh, habits, virtues that, again, orient toward the common good and that put the common good ahead of greed, ahead of um, power over dynamics, ahead of I win, you lose, which is a reptilian brain dynamic. Um, it's, it's, it, to me, it's just becoming more and more patent. I wrote a book on evil several years ago, and uh, it's a big book. And the new edition that came out last year um, had a forward by, um, oh my, my name's slipping him. The Indian fellow who lives in California. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting his name. Who remembers his name? Um, anyway, what's, what's, the name of the, what's the name of the book? The name of the book, oh, Sins of the Spirit, Blessings of the Flesh, uh, Transforming Evil in Soul and Society. And, um, but the fellow who everyone knows and is a very bright doctor, I'm sorry, I can't remember his name right now. He says in the new forward, he says that evil is the number one spiritual question for the 21st century. That the question of evil is going to be coming at us. And I couldn't agree more. It's time to talk about evil. And evil is much bigger than sin. It's much bigger than our peccadillos. It is things like destroying Mother Earth as we know her and destroying millions of other species that are literally have gone extinct and are going extinct because of our indifference. So, um, so again, back to birth control, it's, you know, first of all, over 90%, 95% of Catholics don't pay attention to what popes are saying about it. But, but it is a, an example of how out of touch a lot of people in their ivory men, men, men in their ivory towers, wrapped in an ideology of patriarchy, how out of touch they are, and how unable they are to even critique where this comes from. Jesus didn't say anything about birth control. Jews practiced birth control in the old days as they do today. And uh, it wasn't an issue for him. Why is it such a, a, a issue for Catholics? Well, because the right wing stole the values of Second Vatican Council under Pope John Paul I and his successor, uh, Pope Benedict, and, and the rallying cry in the church, the political rallying cry was, where do you stand on Humanae Vitae, the, the, uh, the encyclical by Pope Paul VI that uh, said you can't change the rules about birth control. I heard, the first time I heard the Dalai Lama speak many years ago, it was at the Greek theater in Berkeley. And there was a question posed to him, what did you think about, what does Buddhism say about birth control? And this was his answer. He said, we've always been conservative about all kinds of life. We've, so we have been against birth control. But he said, when you look around the world today and you realize that this excess human population is destroying all these other 
uh, beings, clearly we have to change our position on birth control. I wanted to stand, stand up and say, Dalai Lama for Pope, Dalai Lama for Pope. I was still a Catholic then. Because <laughs> yeah, you evolve your morality as evolution happens. And of course, for, for the longest part of our history as human beings, we didn't want birth control. We wanted kids because so few kids survived and we needed them to help us survive. And so there was a reason why birth control was, was, not, um, was not promulgated really strongly. But uh, today we don't need more kids. We need smarter kids and saner kids and kids who carry values. And um, clearly the human race has to stop um, reproducing. Uh, and uh, so rapidly, and because we, that is a big part of the equal crisis, no question about it. I like to say that uh, this one biblical commandment that has been obeyed, be fruitful and multiply. Mm. Okay, let's check that one off and try another one. <laughs> <laughs> Well, also the one that's been translated as dominate um, uh, the rest of creation. But I, you go to the original Hebrew and it says you build a fence. <laughs> you know, so that's a little less, what can I say, dominating, a little yes. less aggressive than dominating uh, the rest of creation. So you're right. Yeah, we have to go back to these texts and either redo them or throw them out. So that's we right. have, go ahead. We have about 12 minutes or so. Uh, and uh, both of you are mentors for so many that are watching right now. And we would like to ask you to offer us uh, a word of hope. Um, each one of you. Uh, John, I'll let you begin if you don't mind. Can you give us a word of hope? Well, uh, several decades ago, I decided that there was no possibility of people really taking the, the consequences of their actions, and I mean collective actions, of course, seriously and trying to change them until the, uh, the horrors that we were projecting for the future began. Well, uh, I think that was correct. It's too bad because when you wait till it's too late to do anything. But I think it's never t too late. And I think that, the, that this past year, there has been a kind of happening in the collective consciousness, the, the sense that, oh, this is what it means, and it's going to get worse, and we don't want it. And I think that the willingness to think about much more radical changes is much greater now than it was before COVID. And uh, it's not, just, and, and before the, the, the climate change had led to the burning down of all of the forests of Australia and now much of much of the West Coast and so forth. I mean, things are really happening now. So it's too late to save the thousands, millions of species that have disappeared. It's too late to avoid climate change. It's too late to avoid some terrible financial problems economic problems, etc., etc. But I don't think it's too late in the sense that this that it doesn't still make a lot of difference how we, how we respond. And I it has had a a more a personal positive impact. That is people are now interested in process thought. Mm -hmm. Uh, in a degree that simply hasn't been true in the past. That, mm -hmm. that is, I think the basic interest is, no, the, the way we've been thinking is not satisfactory. We really need to be ready to rethink mm -hmm. 
and process thinking is one of the alternatives. I actually think it's the major alternative at a very fundamental level. So I'm hopeful that at last change will go get on the agenda. Maybe four years from now, if the Democrats have 20 people running, one or two of them at least will talk about making real changes. I think they will. But this year was a good example of what's, what's happened. The really important issues were not discussed in the primaries. It certainly won't be discussed in the in the presidential campaign. They would, well, I, I won't say any more about that, but, but that's really shocking when the actual crisis is upon us that it doesn't get mentioned in the political world. I don't think that will continue. John, you're a theologian um, and you've talked a lot about God um, I've read a lot of that <laughs> and, and I get the feeling that for you there's something in the universe something in the cosmos that's on the side of life and on the side of hope uh, not all powerful but steadfast um, and love and do, do you think that faith in that kind of reality faith in God thus understood um, can play a role, should play a role in how we orient our, our inner lives toward the, toward the future. Do you want the, Yeah, just, I, just any thoughts. Yes, any thoughts. Oh, of course. I, I, I think that our belief in God means that no matter what happens, even if there's a nuclear war and the whole planet is poisoned, uh, God will be working t to keep life going. And um, I hope there will be some humans left in that. And whatever, whatever God can, can do against, I mean, to align ourselves with God is the one most general principle that I think we need to teach. Mm -hmm. Knowing that God loves us and we are called to love God. And that of course you cannot love God and not love your neighbor. And not only your neighbor, but your enemy. Mm -hmm. But, but um, it, it's, it's amazing how even people who talk God language don't. Uh, I don't know. Well, what, maybe it's because their idea of God is so different from mine. Well, thank you so much. And I think Matthew's gotten up for a second, but Matthew, um, you need to close us out. And so if you can uh, offer a word of hope or, or just a word of Matthew Fox, that's fine with us. Um, can you bring our discussion to a close in whatever way you would like? Well, again, all of us, I think, have to re-understand the phrase, love your neighbor, that our neighbor does not just mean our two-legged neighbors. It means the trees and the soil and uh, the birds and the reptiles and the fishes mm -hmm. and the four-legged ones. So we have to expand our understanding of community and, and love of neighbor. Um, I think that's, that's primary to put that instruction into practice. But as far as hope goes, I love um, David Orr's the definition of hope, the eco-philosopher. He says, hope is a verb with the sleeves rolled up. What I like about that is it, uh, hope is relative. It's relative to what humans are willing to do. Are we willing to, first of all, wake up Thomas Aquinas, by the way, says that's the first resurrection. There are two resurrections, he says. The first is waking up in this lifetime. If you wake up in your th this lifetime, you don't have to worry about the second resurrection, he says. 
And I think that's where we're at. We have to wake up. And as John says, the bad news is one way of waking us up, hitting over the head, being hit over the head with, with these two by fours, the Australian um, uh, fires of last summer and the West on fire this summer. And of course, in the South, these floods and hurricanes and piling up on each other. I mean, everything is changing and it's not going to be better. And even if we get beyond this coronavirus, there are going to be more viruses because we've encroached on these other habitats of other beings who have a right to be here, et cetera, et cetera. So the inner work, we have to do the inner work as well as the outer work. And the inner work means we have to work on our greed. We have to work on why we have an economic system that is all about making us greedy and why we acquiesce to that. You see, it's, there's no religious tradition in the world that we know of that advocates greed, that greed is good for a community, because it isn't. <laughs> as, as, as Gandhi said, there's enough for everyone's need, but not for everyone's greed. So we need an economic system that is based on needs, not on greed. And obviously, for example, healthcare is a need, because I think last time I checked, we all have bodies and uh, bodies run into some trouble once in a while. So why don't we have health care for everybody? We need shelter for everybody. We need education, but, but uh, education and values as well as in facts uh, for everybody. And you alluded, Jan, I'm glad you did, to ritual because uh, this is the ancient way of education. You know, for 95% of our existence as a species, we did not put kids or adults into chairs and say, sit there and, uh, and take this in. We, we, we taught our great values and stories through ritual and ceremony. And um, that is a shortcut to teaching new values in the new cosmology that brings new values because it teaches us how creation works, how nature really works. And it doesn't work um, without balance. And the the word for balance is, is justice and sustainability. I think sustainability is a, is a 21st century word for justice. What is unjust is not sustainable. And uh, so I see signs of hope in movements of today, uh, mm -hmm. Extinction Rebellion movement. Who doesn't want to resist extinction? I mean, <laughs> is this a way to get people out of their couches and waking up? Hey, we're going extinct along with all these other species. So maybe if we love our, our being alive, but that's the bottom line that, you know, uh, Adrian Ritz says that patriarchy teaches, it teaches fatalistic self-hatred, fatalistic self-hatred. And I think that's why there have been no, no environmental laws since 1973, as John says, because there's a fatalistic self-hatred. It's a virus that has taken over the human mind and it goes with patriarchy. We have to deconstruct patriarchy. We have to talk about this abuse in the name of masculinity, a pseudo-masculinity, a reptilian brain masculinity. That's why I wrote a book on the sacred masculine that masculinity can be a wonderful thing, but it also can, is killing the planet. And so the return of the divine feminine, that's what I loved about working on Julia of Norwich and the, my book's coming out next next month because she has 700 years ago she was a mess. she deconstructed religious patriarchy she said in God there is no wrath and there is no vengeance unlike what the church tells us of course her book wasn't published for 300 years because she was a woman <laughs> and when it was published few paid attention to it but we're ready for it today she lived through the greatest pandemic in Western history the bubonic plague. She was seven when it first hit and it kept coming back in waves right into her 80s when she died. And she, unlike the men who went crazy, men established these clubs where they flagellated themselves because with no science, they said, what's the cause of this pandemic? Oh, it must be our sins. So they went from village to village flagellating themselves for their sins. It got so out of control, such a big popular movement that the Pope had to intervene and say, hey, no, that's not the way to go. Meanwhile, Julian kept totally grounded in her love of nature. And God is in nature, she said. In fact, God is nature, she said. And is thoroughly creation-centered and ecologically centered uh, spirituality. And we're ready for her today. We weren't ready then. But she has a whole understanding of the divine feminine that we need desperately today. 
And so I find great hope in these mystics because they have a bigger picture. They have a bigger picture of what's, what's going on. And, um, and they have uh, the creativity to, to show us uh, directions we can, we can go in. I think deep ecumenism is another sign of hope. The fact that in this crisis, um, we're working elbow to elbow with Buddhists and Hindus and Christians and Jews and Muslims and atheists. Because uh, as I said in my book, The Cosmic Christ 30 years ago, there's no such thing as a Buddhist ocean and a Roman Catholic forest and a Baptist sun and a Lutheran moon. Once we reset, reset our religions as well as the rest of our lives, education, politics, law, medicine, and everything else in the context of creation, which is what is being demanded of us today in the context of the earth, everything gets shuffled and everything learns a little bit of humility. And I think religions are learning a little bit of humility today and how we can learn from one another. And I say, if you're a Buddhist, be the best Buddhist you can and bring that to the table. And if you're an atheist, bring, be the best atheist you can be and bring that to the table. And if you're a Jew, the same. And if you're a Christian too, bring, bring these mm -hmm. ancient traditions. And of course the indigenous have so much to teach us today because they've never forsaken their relationship with the whole, with the holy whole, with the sacred mother earth and father sky. So there's so much we can learn from um, our past and so much with science's help. And again, science it can be another wisdom tradition. And science has so much to teach us today, not just about the dangers we're in and how things are dying all around us, but also about ways out, about cre creative ways to, for example, redo energy and truly make it um, uh, uh, renewable and clean, et cetera, et cetera. So all hands on deck. And let's, let's throw off this, we're spending $56,000 a second on weapons, and we call it defense departments. Well, the real defense should be against, against humans who are destroying the earth not because my ideology or my, my politics is different from yours across the ocean, but because uh, we're facing this crisis together. So the old adage that necessity is a mother of invention, I think that's really true. My reading of history is that humans only get off the couch, only get out of the comfortable uh, that we're in when there's a crisis, when we have to. And today we have to. So I find hope in that despair. I that's find great. hope. That was actually one of the questions, how to shift from despair, from grievance to hope. And I think that you, you just answered it. Uh, I think, by the way, the person was Deepak Chopra. Thank you, Deepak Chopra wrote the forward. Chopra, yeah, Chopra. Yeah. Uh, we called this event a Dreaming and Ecological Civilization. It could be renamed um, Dreaming a Julian Civilization, as in Julian of Norwich. Uh, uh -huh. You've pointed us in such good directions. John Cobb, you have too. And so I think all of the people's listening to you today want to give you um, an online applause and I'll begin right now. <laughs> so thank you both. And that's for a great conversation today. We're glad we got the two of you together. May you get together again and again and again. Thank Goodbye you. everybody. Thank you, John.